He is an author, a pastor, a missionary, an organizer of missions, he's an administrator, and he's written another really fascinating book. He's Jeff Scoggins, I'm John Bradshaw, and this is our conversation. Jeff, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, thank you. So you've written this book. I've hidden it behind me and I want to pull it out right now. Regrets on an African River, a collection of fun stories from your life in the mission field, largely growing up in the mission field. We'll talk about that in a minute. I really want to talk about some of these stories and more, but let's go back to the beginning for you. Where did you spring from? Tell me something about your early life. Uh, I I have a hard time answering the question, where's home? Let's put it that uh, way. Okay. Uh, I was born in Germany. My dad was drafted at the time. And uh, so then we came back and I spent actually the first 10 years of my life down south in the U.S. Uh, at that time, my parents got a call to go to the Middle East, Beirut, Lebanon, which was exciting because there was a war going on uh, and there's stories in the book about it. Uh, and then after that, we came back to the U.S. Uh, for a little while and then to Africa. Okay. So uh, I spent some time in Rwanda and then in, went to school in Kenya, the mission school there. So I was back and forth between there. Came back to the U.S. again, went to college, got married and uh, went to uh, Russia with my wife. So spent uh, three years in Moscow. As working. newlyweds, you went to Russia. Well, it, we, yeah, it was it were within the first two three years something like that yeah that's yeah. newlywed yeah and yeah. so wow. yeah and and then interspersed within that uh mission work in the u.s as well uh, kind of overseeing the entire um mission uh outreach that we were doing as a church so you were doomed to be a missionary i guess if you want to call yeah. it doomed yes. you were doomed to be a missionary not, not, couldn't be a, a greater privilege. Oh, how fantastic. So you went to Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, was, it the, was it the food that attracted you guys? You know, it was my parents, and I have no idea what attracted them. Uh, but uh, I know that I absolutely loved it. I well, did not want to leave. Oh, yeah. Even though you're in the middle of a war, war-torn situation, because Lebanon's a beautiful place and a fascinating place, and I found the people there to be wonderful uh, what do you remember about it? I remember everything about it. Yeah. And, and I remember not being able to sleep when we came back because it was too quiet. Oh. Uh, yeah. So, so what, we, what were you hearing? What was the noise? Oh, we could sit on our, our porch, which is on the hill overlooking Beirut. And you, we, we could watch the tracer bullets and the bombs blowing up and everything. And, and uh, for the most part, we were fairly safe where we were. For the we, most part? For the, well, we spent our nights in the bomb shelter every once in a while. What, yeah, about, so. what about the other part? The most part, you were safe. The other part? Uh, the other part, we were going to the bomb shelters. <laughs> did, did you never look down at the traces and just think, well, you know, it's not outside the realm of possibility that something could veer off course? Uh, well, it happened. I had several five-gallon containers full of shrapnel and bullets and stuff. So, yeah, I didn't know it happened. Uh, but we just weren't all that concerned about it. I was the first few nights. I, in fact, there's a story in the book about my first nights there. And it's titled, How to Get Unused to War. Uh, and uh, or how to get used to war. Maybe that was, I don't remember. But anyway, uh, the, the whole idea in there is that you get into anything for long enough and you get used to it. So true. And, and, and the same happened for war. And my point in the book is the same happens with sin. Absolutely to get right. To the point where you just, you don't even think about it. And, and, and you start to, frankly, even miss it when it's not there. Yeah, yeah. So as wild as it was, yeah, we were used to the war. And, and we, we were amazingly enough, reluctant to leave it because we actually said that to our parents. We don't want to go. We're going to miss the war. You know, so it is crazy stuff, but it's what you can get used to is something. Because somebody who's a parent right now heard you say all that and said, oh, I could never. Oh, we could never. And so maybe they could never. Um, but your parents thought, oh, you're taking our kids in the middle of a, of a war. That's okay. What sort of adjustment was that like for you as a kid to go from somewhere here in the US to a, a, a totally different culture. You left all your friends behind, all whatever your creature comforts were here behind. You go to foreign place, foreign food, foreign people, foreign language, and a war. Did that have a negative impact on you in any way? Not in the least. Um, I, everybody talked about culture shock. I never experienced it. 
until I came back. Oh, tell me about that. That was a culture shock. Why? It was home. It was home, uh, but I had already been homeschooled at home when I was there. We went and I was with mission kids and uh, in the mission field and and uh, I understood that. It, was, it just took me, it was instant. I could pick that up. When I came back, I didn't know what the dirty words were. I didn't know what the latest movies were. I didn't know these, you know, all these different things. And kids, especially at that time, could be brutal. And uh, I just wanted to go. I just wanted to get out. I wanted to go back. And uh, when I started to figure out how to get along in this kind of society again, I kind of went the opposite direction. I went to the other ditch, and I think, they never said it, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if that's, if that's why my parents said we're going to Africa, because I was figuring out a little too well how to get along in this kind of a culture. So you <laughs> didn't know the, 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 the music and the movies and the pop culture references and so forth. You, you, I'll come back to my question for you in a second, but I have an observation. I was talking to a missionary kid, I bet you know who he is, and um, I asked him how he identified coming back to the, or how he identified after living overseas for so long. I come to find out he has a, a foreign parent mm. and he really identifies with that culture. Well, I'm looking at him and you're an American man. Well, he looks at himself and he goes, no, I'm this other nationality. Okay, and, and he explained why that was. He said, coming back to live in the United States, I'm playing catch up, I don't know this, I don't know that, I don't know the other. He'll end up back in the mission field because it's where he feels comfortable. And yeah. coming back to this, to the garbage, it's not all garbage, but coming back to the garbage can be a really difficult adjustment. When you were growing up as a kid in Lebanon and you were deprived of movies and deprived of uh, popular music and you were deprived of McDonald's presumably and you were deprived of all of that, did it ever feel like deprivation? Did you ever feel like I'm missing out on something? I didn't even know about it. I didn't even know about it, I didn't care about it. It was just not important. And it even took me a while when, when I came back to decide, okay, maybe I better make this important. Yeah. And uh, that was a mistake, frankly. Why, why, why did you make it important? To be accepted, to get along. Um, the, the bullying, that kind of stuff. There's stories in the book about that. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was rough, it was rough. But I wouldn't change it even if I could because it grew me as a person in ways I don't even understand totally. Uh -huh. I can now go back and forth between cultures with no problem. As a kid, you, 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 you bought into the mission thing. You understood why you were there. But, but let me just dig into that a little deeper. Did you really understand why you were there? What was the depth of your understanding? We are here to be missionaries. Did you <laughs> take that on board as a kid? No, I didn't. Uh, for us, it was just a new place to live for me and my brother and sister. Uh, we knew that my dad was doing mission, and, and I grew up with the idea in my mind that I would do the same, not necessarily overseas. That, that wasn't the point. It was just that life was about ministry, no matter what we did. Okay, so, 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 so you did kind of take it on board. I, I took it on board, but maybe. I would have taken it on board, I think, even here. So... Maybe not, though. Who knows? I, yeah, maybe. well, yeah, we don't know. And yeah. like you said, maybe, but you certainly did there. So I find that really interesting. You're in a ministerial family. You, your parents were serving as missionaries overseas, and it was inculcated into you somehow, whether, whether implicitly or explicitly, this is what my life's going to be. Yeah. I'm going into ministry. I never expected anything else. How fascinating. Okay, okay, so let me ask you this. So there are parents today who would wish that their children would grow up to do something a little more meaningful than record TikTok videos. <laughs> How would you advise those parents to go about establishing a culture within their own culture of ministry? Not that every kid needs to be a pastor or a church school teacher, but what do we do as parents? Give us one, two, three little piece of advice to help our kids see a greater meaning in life than Okay. Blather. There's absolutely no substitute for believing that yourself as a parent. And if that is what your life is, and that's really all your kids know, it's not something that you feel like you have to inculcate. 
It's something that just is. Now, that doesn't mean every kid is going to go into the ministry. Right. But that, like you said, it doesn't have to be a pastor. You can be a mechanic and be in the ministry. Correct. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really, truly about that's authentically what you are as a family. And if that is the case, then the, everything else belongs to the Holy Spirit. I asked you for three. I got one, and that's probably going to be enough because I must ask you this. It, it, it pains me, but I want to ask you how you feel. You, you're involved in, in mission from a global perspective right now. You strategize, you plan, you identify areas of need. I can't wait to talk to you more about that. Our greatest resource as a church, however you define church, is our people. You might say, if you want to, that our greatest resource, among that greatest resource, is our young people. But you see young people everywhere throwing their lives away. And I don't just mean making poor lifestyle choices. Uh, that's an easy target, but people have been doing that forever. I don't mean that. I mean, man, kid, you've got great potential. You do so much for God. What does it do to you to see the amount of young people we have not turned on by mission or ministry? That's got to break your heart. There is absolutely no question. Um, but I, uh, I have to say that I'm neither am I surprised. Uh, when we allow our children to become a part of the culture the way that we do, uh, what else do you expect? I think it was Gordon Beats once that said, you buy where you shop, and he was talking about something else, but the same thing works for any situation. If, if, if that's what you do in your home, and if it's all about your phone and your iPad and the movies you're watching and stuff, that's what life is going to be. But if, if life is, is, revolves around other things, that's what it will be as well. So the, the one thing that I can say, well, I could say many things, but one of the things that I could say about the way that I was raised is that my parents were always completely authentic. And for them, that's what they did, and so that's what we did. And, and if you do something else, then what do you expect? That's where your kids are going to go for the most part. Now, I, 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 I say that carefully because there are parents that will of course. say that, you know, that our whole life. There is another ditch, and, you know, it doesn't matter which one you fall into. The devil's happy either way, you know, and, and to, to, to where the kids feel like this is forced, where it's whatever, and, and they'll rebel against it. I understand. But this was, uh, this was a completely authentic, unforced kind of situation. Yeah. And the, and the thing we remember, too, is <clears throat> you can have the greatest parents who do, give the kids the greatest upbringing. At the end of the day, a Every, kid has their free choice. That's and, right. and they're going to do it. They that do. is absolutely right. However, we cannot get away from the fact that we, to an enormous degree, prepare our kids for the choices that they make. There's no question. Yeah. So uh, Lebanon came and went. He came home. When you, as a kid who was starting to get a little wild and woolly, went back to Africa, did you chafe against that? Or was it like, ah, oh, blessed relief, went no, back to the missions? I was angry. Were you? Oh, I was angry. And yeah. There's a story in the book about it. Um, yeah. I was very upset. I did not want to go. I had worked hard for what I had gotten. Sure. Uh, it took me years before I recognized that my parents had probably done the right thing. Wow. Yeah, it was. And, and uh, it, was, there, it wasn't a difficult transition for me culturally. It uh -huh. wasn't a difficult transition for me in school. None of that. It was just pure and simple being upset to leave what I had gained. And, you know, it was a formative time. I was, what, 14 years old or something mm, like that, you know? Mm, and so uh, I had worked hard to find those friends and make those friends, you know? And so that's, that was when I, when I, when I got to Africa, once I made new friends, everything smoothed out and everything was okay. Uh, but until then. <laughs> so you made your Rwanda, your family went to Rwanda? Yes. Okay. And where was this in terms in the timeline? This was before the terrible. This was before, well before the genocide. Yeah. Uh, my parents actually ended up spending seven years and they left about two years before the genocide happened. Yeah. And uh, then I was, I only stayed in Rwanda for about a month and then I flew off to school in, in Kenya. Yeah. 
And so my school bus was an airplane, and I went back and forth um, for a couple of years there. This is something we can spend hours talking about, but I only intend to ask you this question and, and dwell on it very briefly, just about Rwanda. When the genocide occurred, did your parents ever say, we saw this coming? Was there ever an indicator for them, or did it kind of take them by surprise? I think it was a total surprise. Uh, for all that we knew, the two tribes got along just fine. But obviously there was something going on below the surface that we didn't see. Right. And, and you may never even been able to see from your vantage point. Exactly. Uh, and as foreigners, maybe we never could have. But uh, everything was completely peaceful and fine when we were there. So Regrets on an African river. <laughs> Man, I picked up this book. I started to read. I couldn't put it down. It was one of those books that you get that annoy you because when it's time to sleep, You'd you rather can. read than sleep. So let's talk about some of the stories in the book. This is the, the, the life and times of Jeff Scoggins growing up in the mission field, having way too much fun and sometimes a little too much mischief. Yeah. Um, we don't have a lot of time before the break, and I expect that this story is only going to get partly told before we go to the break. And sure. that's fine with me. Okay. There's a story in the book called Regrets on an African River called Regrets on an African River. I read this story you guys in a river and a male figure, was he a family friend or an uncle? You'll tell me. <laughs> and I thought, oh man, this, this, is, this is big trouble. Tell the story. Okay. Um, uh, I can tell the story in a half an hour. To do it in two minutes is going to be a challenge. Yeah, so we'll just, I, won't, we'll just, I won't try. We'll dip into it. We'll, we'll pick it up after the break. Okay. Um, it was the director of the Adventist Development and Relief Agency, Carl Wilkins, who was there and drug us into this. And it was me and my cousin, Cameron. And uh, we took off on a trip down a river filled with hippos and crocodiles, and uh, we didn't make it home that night. Hold tight. So, <laughs> you, deadliest animal in Africa after the mosquito yeah. is the hippo. Did you know you're getting to a river that had hippos in it? We did. We were armed. No, well, we did. We did. <laughs> with baseball we bats. Did. We were going to shoo the hippos away. So, were you guys, yes. is this typical behavior for missionary kids, or were you mad? No, I wasn't mad. Um, I'm mad crazy. Carl right? himself is fearless, and that's... that's um, so that's what uh, that is. It, it's contagious. Okay. Uh, you know, we're 20 years old at the time, uh, invincible. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, he, he warned us. He said, you know, there's crocodiles and hippos. And we said, no problem. We, that's fine. It's a little bit about that thing you mentioned earlier, a proximity to danger. After a while, you don't see the danger. That can, but, but, but is that like today there are, mission, there are missionary kids doing the same thing going down or have they learned you just stay away? <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that very well, but I suppose there are. Mission okay, okay. kids are, are a different breed. I'm trying to understand the mindset. <laughs> they are so you're different saying breed. you probably weren't the first and you probably weren't the last. Uh, probably not. Okay, so you got in a boat, you're in a river with crocodiles and hippos. Yes, and we How, had some what, exciting what times. What can go wrong? Yeah, what can go what wrong? Can go wrong? And it it did it got dark we tried hiking out we tried all sorts of stuff and we couldn't we ended up sleeping under a, a hay bale the, the whole night long and uh would, would the it, next day the french military came looking to it for us in the gunship coming down the river uh anyway yeah, there's a there's there's a whole story there we can't tell. so there were there were people back there who were expecting you to get back uh, i even told uh, carl and cameron who were with me i said you know we have the easy end of this because our parents are right now worried sick thinking that we're dead or something and they didn't sleep the whole night you know when we we did a little bit but uh not them uh, but not them no and were they worried you were dead or were they saying ah oh, those guys are no fine. no I, I my guess is they they thought we had gone down or something had happened yeah uh, that's just one of the stories we'll talk about more <laughs> in just a minute glad you're joining us for this with jeff scoggins i'm john bradshaw more in a moment of our conversation The Bible is filled with stories of people who took a leap of faith. Gideon was asked by God to lead an army of just 300 against an innumerable foe. And he did, and he was triumphant. Noah was asked by God to build an ark, a boat, so he and his family could ride out a storm in a world where rain had never before fallen. And he did, and he and his family and the world was saved. Life can be like that. Sometimes you have to take a leap of faith. After you've received all the necessary instructions, 
after the equipment has been checked. You take a leap of faith. Grow your faith in God and in His Word. Don't miss The Leap of Faith, brought to you by It Is Written TV. Welcome back to Conversations brought to you by It Is Written. My guest is the man who wrote this book, Regrets on an African River, oh, and Other Adventures. It's an adventure story. Stories from a young fellow who grew up in the mission field. Uh, these were his experiences. Uh, Jeff Scoggins must have had a great amount of fun writing the book. How, how did it come about? <laughs> it was an accident. Um... I have the stories I've got. I keep a list yep. of everything that ever happens to me that someday may be a story for sermon illustrations That's or whatever. That's very it may be. smart. Yeah. And uh, so, as when I, I was pastoring in Minnesota, and uh, I put out a, a monthly newsletter, and I would always start it with a story of some sort. And so, over the years, as people read these stories, they began to bug me about it. You need to put these into a book, and I just smiled and said, "Yeah, I'll never write a book." Um, and uh, finally, I just had them all together and sat, thought to myself, well, why not? It wouldn't even require anything. So I put them all in one file, sent them off to a publisher, and they took it. So um, glad they did. <laughs> we need more books like this. You're, you'll remember in the days of yore, there were lots of mission books, and it seems like every missionary wrote a missionary book almost, yeah, yeah, and very I inspiring. I, I don't see nearly as many of them today, and I wish, and I, wish I did. Um, so you, you, you wrote the book, you were a minister of the gospel, uh, you collected the stories, got around to writing the book. Um, let's talk about a couple more of the stories in there. There's one that I remember, you were, uh, you were in the house, uh, decided you were gonna practice some karate moves, <laughs> got too close to a wall. There's a point I wanna make after you tell me that story. Tell the story, it's a great story. Okay, uh, this was, in, you know, we say mission field, and so we're thinking these all have to happen in Africa or the Middle East or something, and they don't. Uh, mission fields everywhere and uh this one actually happened in south carolina we had just come back from the mission field from from beirut and we are renting a house short term while we were figuring out where we were going to be and uh so the house didn't even belong to us uh and and i had a i had my own room probably for the first time ever in my life and wow. so i thought this was pretty cool uh, uh we went to the library and i checked out a bunch of martial arts books because i thought that was pretty fun i was probably 12 at the time and uh, so I'm there practicing judo and throwing my brother over my head and, you know, different things like this. And well, one day I'm, I'm, I'm practicing kicking and uh, I didn't realize how, how weak sheetrock was and put my foot all the way through the wall. Uh, not wanting to tell my dad what happened, I took a, a poster that was on the other side of the room and thought it would look really good on this side of the room, Egyptian mummy or something like that. And, and, and I, I stuck it there over the wall. Well, we ended up finding where we were going six months later or something, and we packed up to move out. And I decided I would donate that poster to the next person that was going to be in that room. Yeah, very you know, generous. I just very generous. Of just me, leave you know. it right there. My dad came in through in a last inspection as we were cleaning up the house and getting it ready, you know, to turn back over to the landlord, whoever it was. And he said, why are you leaving your poster? And I said, I just, I just thought I would leave it. And my dad said, I don't think so. And went and took it down and discovered the big hole in the wall. Uh, so, um, yeah. <laughs> the, Be we, sure your sins will find it, you out. And that's my point in the story is we sometimes think that you know, if enough time goes by, our sins will go away, and that's not the way God deals with sin. Um. <laughs> you know, one of the things that really struck me about this book, and it, the book did not not need to be this way. It's uh, this book here, Regrets uh, on an African River and Other Adventures. The book did not need to be this way, Jeff, but you wrote the book with spiritual lessons. I, 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 and I don't mean this. I, I stayed out in the sun and I got warm and it reminded me of the warmth of God's love. <laughs> that's yeah. a legit lesson. Oh, it is. Well, that's, sure. that's, that's pretty gentle. Yeah. There are no lessons like that. I mean, you, you don't hold back. You, you, you talk about sin and righteousness and obedience. And I'm not meaning to say it's overbearing. I don't mean that. But you kind of go for the, not for the jugular, but you, you make it count. Your spiritual lessons count. 
there's a reason you did that. You didn't you didn't soft pedal or sugarcoat or worry about stepping on somebody's toes. I mean, these are meaningful lessons. Is what I mean, why'd you go there when you could have you could have painted this any color you wanted? I was pastoring at the time, and I was dealing with real people with real issues. So these stories arose out of situations where it wouldn't have been wise to tackle the problem face on, but a story with an illustration. I mean, that's how the Bible works for the most part. I mean, most of the Bible is stories, and they're very effective in that way. They, they come kind of at an oblique angle, you know, rather than just punch, uh, where people won't listen very well. And so I, I hope that the, the Holy Spirit was, was guiding as I wrote those stories, often for specific situations, um, and uh, hoping that the people would actually read them and maybe apply it to their life. Only time will tell how that worked, but that's, that's the reason, because most of these come from, from real life situations. I mentioned earlier that it was my belief that you were, you were doomed to work in missions. It just seemed to be that way. But you, you've spent a considerable amount of time in the pulpit as a local church pastor. Two questions. First, was, was that comfortable or did the jacket not fit quite well if you were just chafing mm. to get out into the mission field? That's one question. And the second question is, uh, tell me about pastoring. So when you're a local church pastor, were you... Was it, was, it, was it like, man, this is not me, I need to get out? Or did, did it fit you well? Yeah. And I'm, not saying, you, I'm not saying, did you do a good job or not? I'm just no, saying, was, I hear was, you. was there an impatience to get to the mission field yeah. or was it all okay? No, um, I, if you had told me that I would be a pastor when I was going through college, I would have laughed in your face. Interesting. I would never, I, I wasn't a public speaker. I wasn't, uh, I, it just wasn't me at all. I did communication and commercial art. That's what I did in college. Um, and I always wanted to work for the church, but never th even considered the idea of being a pastor. Yeah. So when I started working for the church, I was working in communication, and I did that for a long time. And, and then I, I ended up in mission, uh, our mission department, if you want to call it that, uh, and loved it. But it was more administrative in that kind of a situation. The thing is, is after we came home from Russia, we decided to start a family, and I didn't want to be traveling all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I said, maybe I should try pastoring. And, and even that was a bit of a shock to me because I, if you look, if you look at, the, at the, the gifts of the Spirit, pastoring was not mine. And so I said, God, if you want this to work, number one, you need to open up the doors. And number two, you're going to have to equip me because you have not. And he did. He did? He opened the doors and he equipped me. Uh, I, f I really felt called to that position for the next 12 years. Um, and it took a significant pull to something else to even pull me out of it. Um, in answer to your second question, it's the most brutal work I've ever done in my life. But it's also the most rewarding. I guess the two go together. Uh, people can be cruel, and and uh, and to remain Christ-like through it all is not something that's easy to do. Let me ask you about that, about the cruelty. And I know you don't say that from a "woe is me" crybaby perspective. Not at I know all. you don't. We both know many pastors. And it's likely that every person watching right now knows or has known pastors who've been run out of the ministry by unkind people. Yeah. What kind of a toll does that take on an individual? And you can speak from your own experience or more broadly, and on a family, because typically a pastor has a spouse, and the spouse, who is the, the second self of that pastor, can't help but take an amount of that on board. To talk about that. Maybe, maybe your comments will encourage someone to be a little more circumspect in their dealings with the pastor. Okay. It's a, it's a difficult subject and deserves its own programs. Um, you're absolutely right. It does take a toll. Um, and there are many things that I learned over time that really helped me. 
Number one is it's not about me. Uh, and, and if I ever have the idea that I can do this in my own strength, I'm fooling myself. Uh, I have never grown so spiritually so fast in all of my life. I mean, if I were to, tr you know, track my progress, when I became a pastor, my spiritual life went like this. Uh, because I had no choice. Uh, I was dealing with, with painful situations that I was clueless to know how to deal with. And so the only option I had was my knees. And uh, I saw God work over and over and over again. I also tried very hard to protect my family. Uh, whether this is for every pastor or not, I don't know, but I simply did not share a lot of the stuff that I was dealing with. Uh, I just didn't deal, I didn't, didn't talk about it. Uh, I put some pretty strict boundaries around my time, uh, and I'm eternally grateful that my church members allowed that. Mm, that's good. Uh, and, and I was perfectly open with the with them what those would look like and and i set i what i did was i set very low expectations for my congregation and then with leaving my room to exceed them and so i i set them low and then i went over and above them because i knew i had that latitude but i committed to only two nights away a week so i could be there for bedtime mm. uh, when my kids were really little and and I wouldn't change that at all. And that's that's very difficult for a pastor to do. Is it possible for every pastor to do? Because even recently, I've spoken to friends who've said, and this one guy one guy really surprised me. Um, several children. I, I just didn't ex I just didn't expect him to say, I burned out, yeah. and I had to step away. Another guy burned out. Probably not such a surprise, Boeing to just he's a real focused yeah. workaholic kind yeah. of a guy. Can every pastor uh, put up healthy boundaries? Is it possible for every pastor to do that? Yes, it absolutely is. Jesus himself could have been the busiest, most overworked person in the world, and yet he didn't. Okay. God is never going to call us to something that's going to destroy us or our family. That's not his calling. Now, the boundaries that I set up for me may not look the same for somebody else. That's sure. fine. Yep. But no, I would say that if, if, you, if you are called to pastoring without boundaries, you're not called to pastoring or any ministry for that matter. Life is made up of boundaries and we have to have them. I was once at a pastor's meeting and the leader of that church organization in that part of the country uh, instructed the pastors mm -hmm. that they are to take time off yes it was really interesting to hear that really yeah. refreshing to hear that yeah we want our pastors to be healthy and not 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 broken by things that they could and perhaps should control yeah okay russia this long mm -hmm. what was that like you were in moscow moscow. Yeah. moscow that was hard on me simply because we lived in a big city yeah and i'm not a city guy uh you know i'm a country boy and and uh i prefer that so that part of it, the job I loved. What were you doing? I was, uh, we're, I was involved in what we call global mission. And uh, we, at the time, were trying to plant 300 new churches in the former Soviet republics. The, the, the Soviet Union had fallen about uh, eight years before or something like that. Things were open, and we were going to take advantage of it. And How did it go? It went very well. We actually ended up with 311. Amen. Um, and uh, it, it ended up having to raise about three to four million dollars. Um, and and <laughs> I remember I got the first $10,000 gift and, and my wife says, great, now do that a hundred more times and yep. you'll hear or, or, or however many it was. And, and I, at that point, I just like, I, I suddenly understood how much money that much money was. And, uh, but God provided. Uh, he sent it and, and we bought little house churches and planted those churches. Now, I didn't do that myself. We had 300 young men that we brought in that were from the cultures and from the languages of the Beautiful. places where they were and trained them and sent them out and did it. So it was uh, um, an amazing time. Yeah, fantastic. Yep. Okay, so most recently you've been working in missions in a global scale. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you do that? <laughs> 
how, how do you like, okay, here's a world. Yeah. There's a whole lot of it to reach. Yeah. And you and others beside you are tasked with affecting that. Yeah. So take me to the drawing board. Tell me what Great. that looks like. Uh, it's an interesting story, a long story, and uh, a story that's not yet finished. Sure. Um, well, it won't be till Jesus comes back. It, right? Well, that's true, too. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, I had already had experience now, uh, I had worked there before and, and uh, then in Russia and then coming back again to the same office where I was before. So I had a background already of several years uh, of this. And, and, and what I realized uh, when, I, when I got there was that we really as a church didn't have a, a very good picture of where we are and where we're not in terms of people groups. Now we could plant, we could plot. Well, actually, I was going to say we can plot where our churches and such are, but we actually can't because we were in so many different systems that there was no one single system that has everything. Uh huh. Sure. And uh, so we we know that we've got churches and hospitals and schools and all of this around the world, uh, but there's no central place where you can just go look at it. You have to find it in all the different places. It's really surprising. Uh, it is very surprising. Well. And so uh, we started working on uh, that, but also we started working on prioritizing the people groups around the world so that we could, we could see which ones we've reached and which ones we've not. And okay. when I say reached and not, that doesn't mean that we've baptized every single person, but that means that we have made enough impact in the group that they have the personnel and the resources and all those things that they need to be able to continue the work for their own group. People groups as opposed to languages? Give me an example. Well, there's lots of ways to divide up people groups, and you have to pick one. Sure. And so we picked languages. That works for about 90% of the world. Uh, there are places like the U.S. where I'm at now that you can't just divide up by language. you got to do a little bit more than that. But anyway... Uh, we, we prioritized all of the people groups of the world. There's about 7,000 languages in the world. And we have something, as, a, as our church, our denomination, has something in 974 of those groups. And when I say something, that is as low as the bar can go. Hold tight. That means if we have a brochure, we counted them. Yeah, hold up. 7,000... 7,000 languages. 7,000 languages and... The church of which you are a part, we are a part, has some kind of presence in 900. That means we may have a pamphlet in yeah, that language. Yeah, yeah. So of that 900, we got something meaningful, you describe meaningful, in how many of the 900? I, I don't even know. I, okay. I have no way to break that down. Okay, there's less than 900. Le probably. This gospel yeah. of the kingdom. Yeah, I know it. Shall be preached in all the world. For a I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. I know. Having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation kindred Indeed, have God. mercy. I know it. Well, this it's not as bad as it sounds. Sure. I know, I know some of these languages have got 25 exactly, people. But exactly. But still, man, still. So that leaves us, uh, give or take, 6,000 languages. That still represents about 3 billion people. Hey, listen, let's be honest. You take a look at a map of the United States and you plot all the churches on the map of the United States, we have some deserts yeah. where we're just not, we're just not, we're just not present. Yeah. Significant areas of people. Some areas we're doing real great. Other areas, it's as though it's, it's the 1040 window. The 1040 window is our big challenge. And does everybody know what 1040 window is? They will when you tell them. Okay, 1040 window, that will take the, the, the latitude lines, 10 and 40 degrees, and, uh, and then specifically kind of across uh, West Africa, all the way over to into Asia, into China. If you just draw a big square around that, that's what we call the 1040 window. It's not really a nice rectangle. And why are we excited by the 1040 window? The 1040 window is the place where Christianity in general has just not been very effective. And I don't know what the current statistics are, but they say like 0.01% or something like that as so Christian presence. You, you, you look in countries like Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, Turkey, uh, 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 give me some more countries so that people understand this thing. All of the Middle East, all of oh, Asia, oh, oh, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Iran, Arabia, and Iraq. All of and, those areas, yes. Yeah, and in some of those places, there's, uh, I mean, to all intents and purposes, zero yeah. Christians. I mean, to all intents and purposes. Yes, it's the non-Christian. If you just pull it out and just say the non-Christian religions of the world, that's who we're not. We've been done pretty well in reaching those with a Christian worldview, a Christian yeah, yeah. background. Yeah. Those without, we've done... Uh, as Christians overall, we've done, we've managed very little. Okay, so I have a question. Therefore, I know you'll have an answer for me. 
You got to, I'm going to give you the break to think about it. The question is, okay then, missionary man, how do we reach these people that we're not reaching? Ah, He'll have an answer for us yeah, in just I wish. a moment. Can't wait to hear it. With Jeff Scoggins, I'm John Bradshaw. This is our conversation brought to you by It Is Written. Planning for your financial future is a vital aspect of Christian stewardship. For this reason, It Is Written is pleased to offer free planned giving and estate services. For information on how we can help you, please call 800-992-2219. Call today or visit our website, hislegacy.com. Call 800-992-2219. Welcome back to Conversations brought to you by It Is Written. You know, I like to ask my guests nice softball questions, just lob them an easy one so they can just knock it right out of the park. So a moment ago, you heard me ask Pastor Jeff Scoggins a real, real easy one. You've been, you've been, in, you've been involved in missions since you were a kid. And we discussed a second ago the 1040 window where there's essentially, to all intents and purposes, no, no strong Christian presence. That's a fact. I think that's a very, very accurate statement. How do we reach these people? How do we introduce people who are not in a Christian context? I'm not talking about your backslidden Christian neighbor down the street in Tupelo. I'm talking about in nations where it's it's hard. How do we reach them or how do we go about getting to the place where we might be able to reach them? This is, I mean, this is what they pay the big bucks for. You've, (laughs) You've charged with nutting this out. What's the thinking, whether in your sphere or in Christianity, broadly about how we're going to get the gospel to these places? Uh, You recognize how difficult of a question that is. So um, I wish I could say that there is is an easy answer, but I do believe there is an answer. Sure. Okay. Uh, But it's not what we've been doing. It's not business as usual. Uh, there are places when mass evangelistic meetings will still do something oh, 100%. Pow- powerful. Yeah, yeah, we're involved in those. But there are yeah. places where that doesn't work anymore. Yeah, I, you know, I, I conduct won't. large evangelistic meetings around the world, but I, I, yeah. I don't know that I'd have a great deal of success in you Aleppo, wouldn't. Syria. We have an example yeah. of something that works. Give it to us. Jesus. Hmm. Tell me, tell me more. There's a Christian author that calls it Christ's method alone. And it doesn't yield huge numbers of baptisms. It's slow. It's difficult. It's very relational. Where Jesus spent time with the people, so much time that he gained their sympathy, their trust, their confidence. And then he met their needs, whatever those needs were. And then finally, after all of that, then he would say, follow me. So it's a one-by-one th- situation. Yeah, yeah, except, ex- I'm agreeing with you, but I, I want to mention this, except massive baptisms did come right there. That's right. Uh, when I was a local church pastor, oh, man, I had this wonderful church. Uh, they've all I've been blessed with is wonderful churches, thank God. That's <laughs> so good. But in one church, I met an elderly man who'd been raised in a mission field, um, and I, no point in naming it, just, I could, but I won't. Uh, and I said to him, what was it like winning souls in that mission field? He said, oh, pastor, if we baptized one, there was a celebration. But in more recent years, the challenge in that part of the world has been building churches fast enough to keep up with the converts. That's the way it works. Yeah. So, so yes, it's it's slow, and I, I think what I'm going to say is it's slow at the beginning initially. That's right. And man, I don't know whether that means in in uh, Somalia one day soon we're going to see thousands flocking to Jesus. I don't know how that looks, but what I do know is that in these unreached, I'm not di- I'm not disagreeing with you. No, I'm just adding a little hope. So yes, you're absolutely so right. R- r- what does that look like in downtown city X? Uh, we do something that we, we fund projects that we call urban centers of influence yep. where we'll go into a city and, and uh, we'll start a business of some sort. We'll figure out what the community needs. Uh, it might be a, a restaurant, vegetarian restaurant. Maybe it'll be a, 
uh, diabetes uh, remission type of thing. Well, sure. Who knows what it all might yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. Something that will begin to support itself uh, e eventually by the income that comes in from the community. But then we, we have our, the, 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 uh, the goal really is to start new worshiping groups around mm -hmm. the city. And so that's just one example sure. of something that we do, uh, especially, particularly in the cities that does this. But it's, very, again, very relational, starts off small. But the hope is, like you say, it will grow and then yeah. Pentecost comes. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what, what you're telling me is that this is clearly very targeted. You don't throw mm -hmm. a dart at a map. Right. Uh, there's got to be some research done because do you need the diabetes thing or is it the restaurant or is it a, a, a barbershop or whatever the case might be? Right. You've got to have the people. The people. The best laid plans are going to come unglued if you can't get the people. So the reason Jesus said pray for the harvest workers. Yeah. So how do you get, I wanna ask you a question and follow up with an obvious one. How do you, how do you get, how do you find the right people are there? The answer to every prayer you've ever prayed for a laborer is breathing right now. Maybe they just don't know it. How do you go about finding missionaries? And, and I think you know where I'm going here. How do you find yeah. these people? We, uh, where I work now, we we are not involved in that piece of it. It happens at the local level. Others they are doing them. the finding, yes. okay, but the finding is taking but place. But the, the finding is taking place. Uh, and as we, we talk to them uh, and, and work with them on finding these people, it's really when Jesus went looking for the 12 disciples, he spent all night in prayer before he chose them, right? This, as far as I'm concerned, is all a prayer thing. You know, and, and when Jesus says pray for the workers in the harvest field, then that's what we do. And he then provides. And then when we start with money, <laughs> uh, the idea of I can't do this because I don't have enough money, I don't think God is able to bless that. But when we start with the people, the money always comes. Yeah, that's Always right. comes. The resources right. are always there. Yeah, so 100%. God works with people. God's got deep pockets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I want to come back to the obvious question in a moment. What I do want to ask you is to tell me about a success story. I understand you may not be able to give a, a country you, uh, you, or, or, or anything, but even just uh, the concept of a, of, of a success story, the, 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 the desert was barren, but now there's at least plants growing out there. Uh, share something in, in whatever wise way you can to encourage us to know that it's, it's, it's difficult, but God is yeah. greater. The best stories come from places we can't identify. Right, of course. Uh, and uh, so I will speak in generalities. Sure. Uh, we have young people that you, we can't get into a, a certain country, say, yep. a, at all as a Christian missionary. Well, no which way. is really interesting that. The, oh, yes, just can't, absolutely. Places you can't get. You can't. But there's two types of people that can go to such countries. Businessmen or businesswomen, either way, um, and students. And so uh, we have a program uh, for one part of the world specifically where we, we call them Waldensian students. So there's there a background go. to that yeah. you can share someday. But yeah. um, we, they, they, they go to school in a country X. Yeah, they go to school, but it's a cover if you want to put it that. And their idea is to make contacts in those in that university, wherever they're at, and start a small group there. And we've had some very interesting beginnings on on some things mm, there mm. another thing that we're, we're we've been working on is what we call the tent maker program from the apostle paul who yes. went out self-supporting missionaries yes and would begin to uh do whatever work needed to be done in in places so in some places where a businessman or a doctor or somebody can get into those places and that's what they do and it's legitimate it's real they're not just faking it and uh, they're, they're doing that business, but at the same time, they are a Christian influence it's, it's, in that place. Somebody is thinking, man, I don't know about the ethics of that. They don't want Christian missionaries, and you sneak them in. Tell, tell, so tell me about the ethics of that. I don't yeah. have a problem with it. But if somebody has an ethical problem with saving somebody's life, then, then I would have questions for them. Um, so if, if, if somebody's about to walk in front of a bus, and all I can do is grab them by the hair and jerk them back, I hope they're not going to say, why did you pull my hair? Um, we're talking about people's lives here. And lots of lives. And lots of lives. Now, I'm not advocating dishonesty. I'm saying not, don't, don't go in and fake that you're a student. If you're, if you're a student, be a student. Be the best student you can be. 
and be real about it. But to say, I'm going to save somebody's life while I'm here, I don't see any problem with that at all. Somebody is wondering if mission service is for them. And mission service takes on, I mean, many different hues, I expect. But what I'm going to talk about is going to another, going to somewhere you don't currently live for the purpose of sharing Christ. Um, how do you identify that in a person? Maybe you don't. How does one identify that within themselves? I think it would start with an impression, a desire to go. That's not the only way someone could be called without knowing it, I suppose. Right, uh, right, the right. Apostle Paul was. Uh, but uh, I think that any time that we receive an impression of some sort and it keeps hounding us, it very well could be the Holy Spirit. And so uh, I would say it, no matter what the situation, no matter what you're thinking about, don't ignore your conscience ever. Uh, pay attention. Uh, it can also come in the form of other people talking to you. They can. Um, God doesn't usually come direct. Uh, he, he speaks through other people. Uh, and so if someone says, hey, I think you would make a great missionary, pastor, something like that, then it's at least worth looking into. We've kind of got away, I think, in the West from a missionary culture. I notice that countries like Brazil are sending out many, many more missionaries than they've ever done before. I think Korea is yes, the same. Yeah. The United States, Western countries, um, it seems not so much. Now, I, I know in a lot of church universities, Lots of kids go out and do a year or a half year, and that's really, really encouraging to me. So there's a strong culture there. Mission giving down precipitously from where it used to be. Have we lost something of the fervor for missions? Or are you going to tell me, no, 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 things are just as good as they've ever been? No, we, we have lost, um, and but this is not an unusual phenomenon. Thinking theoretically or historically, mm -hmm. uh, Christianity has always moved. Okay, so when we when it started out with Jesus and the apostles, it was very much located in the 1040 window. Yeah, it's true. And and uh, the church boomed there and then declined. And just before it died, it leaped to Europe and to beyond. And then it leaped to the United States. The same thing is happening as it fades in Europe and it fades in the United States. It's going to the global south. And, and so I'm not saying that this is a that it's a good thing that Christianity dies anywhere. Sure, sure. But I'm saying that God is in control, and Christianity is not in no no danger of dying. Uh, if it uh, as an overall, it may fade in, in some places and, and lose. We are in a war, after all, a no, great yeah. controversy. Yeah. And so, give and take and, and ebb and flow is is to be expected. But um, uh, Christianity is going to continue to move and and uh, until Jesus comes. How how do we how do we regain something of that fervor for missions? You know, while I'm while I'm here and that neighbor's a Christian, that neighbor's a Christian, that neighbor's a Christian, yeah. that neighbor is a Christian, that guy, yeah, I'm not so sure. Uh, there there are, there are countries where not one in a million people is a Christian. We've got to we've got to be concerned about that. If if the fervor is waning a little bit, how do we get how do we get that mission fervor back? Probably by doing it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the reason that we had mission fervor before uh, in the way that we did was because people were doing it and they were writing books That's right. about it. Right. Lots of people and, were doing and it. So there was there. I mean, everybody understands this idea of viral. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Missionaries or the the missionary life was a viral concept once upon a time. And that is because it catches fire. If we let it die, then it's our own fault, but it's going to catch fire. Um, if, if we, if we are able to talk about it and write books about it. And that's part of the reason that I wrote the, the, that, that mission book is because yeah. I want to contribute to that. Yeah. Um, I have said this to many guys who do kind of what you do. I've said, uh, beats working for a living. <laughs> and I say that facetiously, but what I mean is to be involved in missions, look, there are some real challenges right now, but you've read the end of the story. That's right. And you know that the gospel will, will go, will go to every last corner of the 1040 window, every country in the Middle East and Africa and Europe and Asia and the yeah, South Pacific. Yeah. So that's pretty cool, right? Yeah, awesome. You're on the winning. You're on yes. the winning team here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Switch gears just a minute because uh, you've written 
Oy, oy, oy. <laughs> Quite a few. There's, there's a lot of work here, man. Yeah. You've written in, 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 in addition to the missionary book. Yeah. Look at this. You can understand the book of Revelation, a simple guide to the book of Genesis, a simple... <laughs> I love the title. A simple guide to the book of Revelation. But, but I get it. A uh, simple guide to the book of Isaiah. Someone just moments ago said they've read your Isaiah book. Paul's epistles. Hey, where'd this come from? What are these about? That comes from my own personal Bible study. I never intended to write. If you say, if I want to say I'm going to sit down and write a book, I can't ever do it. It doesn't work that way for me. I just, I will blank. Um, I, while I was pastoring, this was uh, the, the way my own personal Bible study. I started journaling. I started getting deeper and deeper as I did that. Started pulling in the work from other authors and, and experts and things. And, and I was constantly getting questions from my church members. You know, what about this? And what about that? And, and I would answer them. And I started to notice how often my Bible study that morning or that week had prepared me for that question. Yeah, sure. And, and it was just mind-blowing to me. And uh, as I started to gain, get all of these, this, this large volume of written stuff, I'm listening. I started to think to myself, books. why am I just keeping this on my computer? People are asking me this. That means there's other people out there. Why don't I just put it together in a book? Yep. I never even asked anybody to publish it. I just did it and 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 put it out there, and it was a smash from the beginning. And so I just kept doing it. And right now I'm working on a simple guide to the minor prophets. Beautiful. Now whether that will become a book someday, I still don't know. But so, it's so anyone interested for me. in getting anyone interested in getting the books, where do, where do they go hunting? Uh, they're on Amazon and that kind of place. My personal website is scoggins.biz, and you can find. All of my podcasts and sermons and videos and where to get the books and all that stuff there. That's the easiest one-stop shop. Outstanding. Outstanding. Well, we sat down ostensibly to chat about your book, um, mm -hmm. about uh, missionary adventures when you're a kid. Looking forward, you see more adventures to come? Without a doubt. I work for the Lord. There's always adventures. It's an adventure, isn't it? <laughs> always, always, always. Never a dull moment. Absolutely fantastic. Yep. Wish you the very best. Thank you very, very much for your time. This has been invaluable. I've been personally enriched, and I know many, thank many you, other people you. have been as well. This program will be watched again and again and again. Thank God for you. Hey, and by the way, thank God for your parents. That's no question. Absolutely. Yeah, thank God for your parents. Thanks. Wish you all the best. Thank you so much, Josh. Appreciate it's been it. a real pleasure. And thank you for joining us. What a great amount of fun this has been. Uh, again, I'm going to repeat a web address for you to find Pastor Jeff's uh, podcasts and sermons and books and things he's written and maybe in the future more things you write go to scoggins.biz that's b-i-z or, or z if you must great to have you joining us uh, look to see you again in the not too distant future with jeff scoggins i'm john bradshaw and this has been our conversation <laughs>